Hello, everyone, and welcome to our mycotoxin analysis webinar. My name is Colin Stead, and I'm one of the regional sales managers for Randox Food Diagnostics. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us. We truly do appreciate it. Today, we're going to give you a little bit of info about who we are. We're going to talk about our biochip array technology and specifically our mycotoxin capabilities within biochip. We're also going to show you a video which will walk you through a step-by-step -step process for our Myco7 biochip kit. We wanted to do this since unfortunately we're not able to perform in-person demonstrations for some of the state labs. We're also going to share a few customer testimonials, highlight our additional arrays for feed and cereals, and then we'll finish with any questions you may have. So a little bit about us. Randox is almost 40 years old. We employ over 1,400 people with 300 scientists and engineers. Uh, we have multiple branches of Randox, including clinical, toxicology, biosciences, and of course, food. One interesting fact about us is that 5% of the world's population receives medical diagnosis using Randox products each year. We also have more new tests in development than any other diagnostics company. Here's an example of some of our customers across the different divisions of our company. As you can see, we have quite a diverse portfolio of customers that we serve, ranging from hospitals to Siemens and Abbott, uh, as well as food customers like Nestle and one of the world's largest wine producers in Gallo Winery. So specifically about Randox Food Diagnostics, we have customers in over 90 countries. Every hour of every day, over a thousand Randox food tests are being carried out globally. And investment in R&D has increased steadily, and now over 30 staff are dedicated to the development of new assays. Here are some of our food-specific customers. On the left, we have some of our international government agencies, and on the right, we have some of our U.S. customers, including state agriculture departments. As I mentioned a moment ago, a lot of investment goes into our R&D. And within the past few years, we've made a substantial investment in our US team as well. We have seven different sales reps covering the, the US. Connor Sokol looks after the Northeast. Connor Smith has the Mid-Atlantic. Steven looks after the Southeast. Rachel has the Great Lakes. Savannah in the Midwest. Trey has the South and Midwest. And then Shelby has the West Coast. And then we have our customer support scientists. Pamela is our team lead. Vanessa, Roberta, and Chris uh, all are part of the team as well. And these customer support scientists are responsible for performing our demos, installations, and the training that takes place during the installations. They are also your technical support once you're using our kits. And as any of our current customers can attest, they are very accessible. And then we also have our leadership team. We have Lauren Aiken, who is the business development manager for all of North America and Alan Huxley, who is our other regional manager. They're both based out of Northern Ireland at our headquarters. And then myself, as I mentioned earlier, I am Colin Stead, and I am based out of Denver, Colorado. As you saw, we have a very diverse customer base, and a lot, a lot of that has to do with the wide range of testing options that we have. We have capabilities in a number of different industries, including meat, honey, seafood, milk, feed and grain, as well as wine. And for those industries, we have three primary technologies. We have our biochip array technology, which is the main thing we're going to talk about today. We have ELISA, and we'll show you some of our ELISA kits at the end of the presentation. And then we have our RX series, which in food is used by our honey and wine customers. One thing I want to point out while we're looking at this slide is the biochip carrier. As you can see, there are nine white squares. Each of those is a biochip and available for a sample. So you can analyze nine samples simultaneously per carrier. As you'll see later, there's an incubation stage and our incubator can hold up to six of these carriers at a time, allowing for batches of up to 54 samples. And now I'm going to introduce you to Monica Ploton. She's our food R&D team leader and she's going to provide you with some more detailed information about our technology. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. 
Uh, thank you very much, Colin, for a nice introduction. My name is uh, Monica Plotan, and I'm a team leader in R&D and uh, for development of mycotoxin test. Today, I would like to tell you a little bit more about our Randox um, technology and its implementation for mycotoxin testing. The core of the Randox biochip technology is the biochip itself. It's the ceramic platform uh, that contains immobilized antibodies on its surface. So we have specific mycotoxin um, antibodies that are immobilized on the specific locations on the biochip platform, as we can see on the picture here. Our technology for um, mycotoxin detection um, is the combat is competitive immunosis and what it means is that our toxin in the sample combines with the labeled uh, by um, labeled by hrp uh, mycotoxin and they compete uh, within the test um, just to give you the, the idea what it really means is that whenever the sample contains more mycotoxin uh, we receive the lower um, binding of our labeled enzyme conjugate to the antibody, which is initiating the chemiluminescence reaction. It means the more mycotoxin in the sample, the lower chemiluminescence um, is produced. The lower contamination of mycotoxin in the sample, it means that the higher chemiluminescence reaction um, emits uh, the light. All our antibodies um, that we employ for mycotoxin analysis uh, are uh, developed and manufactured in-house. And we have both monoclonal and polyclonal antibodies employed for mycotoxin testing. In this slide, you can see our biochip, so our core of technology. This is the small square, white square is in the middle of the slide. And on the right side, you see the different spots. Each spot corresponds to different mycotoxin. Here we have an example of Myco7 biochip. And as you can see by this um, kit, by this biochip, we can detect all together from the one sample aflatoxins, zralinol, fumonisins, ocratoxin A, dioxinivalenol, and also T2 and HT2 toxin. So the huge advantage of our technology across all the bio, uh, immune assays is its multiplex. On the biochip, we have a huge capacity of testing. And in the carrier, as you can see on the left side picture, you can see in each carrier contains nine biochips, which means that the nine samples can be tested by one carrier. In the kit, we provide six such a carriers, which is giving us a total of 54 tests that we can perform using a single kit. One carrier is always accommodated for the standard curve, which is giving us between three to 45 tests you can perform during one run. So we can test through between three and 45 samples per run for all the toxins as we detect them simultaneously. So just to summarize the endpoint measurement, what we have on our biochip, um, so on the biochip surface, we have a specified antibody spotted on individual places. We are adding our conjugated with HRP mycotoxin together with our sample that's compite during the test. And in the presence of luminal peroxide, generate light reaction. The chemiluminescence that we observe, and you can see it here in the picture, is captured by the camera that is situated in our evidence investigator system investigator then quantifies using the relative light units um, that are given for each DTR, so for each mycotoxin of interest, to the concentrations based on the standard curve that we run during the run. Uh, in the minute, I will show you the video uh, that will nicely go through the sample preparation, Nazi preparation, uh, Nazi protocol, but here just very really briefly would like to show you how easy um, the sample preparation is to perform. So we just have our sample and it's a single solid liquid um, step um, before we add it to our biochip. The SA protocol, again, we'll, show, we'll see it in a second uh, during our video, 
but it just summarizes how many steps are involved during our essay pro procedure, which is six. As you can see, it's quite simple and straightforward. At the end point of the measurement, what obviously is important for us is our results and report. Uh, each sample that we test, so it's each single batch that we loaded our sample in, is giving us the concentrations for each talking, toxin of our interest. So in the final report, we have a concentrations for all individual toxins, or the report can be printed, can be exported to Excel, and also our system is MIMS compatible, so whatever you uh, prefer. Now I would like to move to the video. So here we have a picture of evidence investigator, uh, which um, is supplied together with a computer and a barcode scanner. Uh, as you can see, it nicely match on the bench. It enables uh, multiplex and mycotoxin detection from a single sample. So it needs increasing your detection capacity and reduces the cost of analysis, as well as labor and laboratory consumables and storage. Here we have a picture of our kit um and what's inside it so inside our kit what we provide is a nine point standard curve so nine points nine small bottles we have acid diluent conjugate conjugate diluent and our biochips let's start with the sample preparation uh, so uh, we take our sample it needs to be milled and homogenized and we weight five grams of the sample to any um, a flask or a sterling, plastic sterling or glass, wherever you have available. available. Uh, then we are adding our extraction solution. So it's 25 milliliters of the mixture of the solvents. It's a mixture of acetonitrile, methanol and water and the ratio 50 to 40 to 10. You can use the pipette or the cylinder, uh, whatever is handy. Once we add, uh, added our extraction uh, solution, we vortex the sample. Uh, we have to be sure we can mix it whatever way you prefer. We have to be sure that the whole a solvent gets to the sample. So we do it for approximately a minute. And then what's important is the 10 minutes shaking. It can be either rolling or other using any other shaker. What's important is that within this 10 minutes, all the toxins are transformed uh, from the sample to the liquid, liquid um, extraction solution. After rolling, um, we centrifuge our sample for two minutes and 1,600 RCF. Um, you can use either a big centrifuge as you can see here as we have in our lab, but you can also use the small centrifuge and just transfer the, uh, the extract to the small Eppendorf and centrifuge. It's just to remove any debris of the sample. Under centrifugation, we do the final dilution in the wash buffer provided and we are ready to start our assay protocol. To do that, uh, we take our kit from the cauldron and let it, um, let it warm up to the room temperature. We take the biochips um, from the kit, uh, as many as you need, depending how many samples you uh, want to run on that particular experiment. Um, you open the biochips and you put them on the um, biochip carrier that is provided uh, together with the investigator, and we start our protocol. So as you can see here at the moment, uh, we pipette 150 microliters of the assay diluent to each individual well on biochip.
all micro and seven micro nine reagents are liquid, ready to use. Um, as they say, um, the one that it's now um, shown on during the video. Once we added all our acid diluent to all the wells, we start um, loading our calibration curve. So we go um, point by point and add each calibration point to individual biochips, starting with your calibration number one. Um, this is because it's our lowest concentration mycotoxin. So our calibrators are multi-toxin calibrations containing all seven main, depending which uh, product you are using. We are loading them in order. It's important as that's how the investigator will then later on process the standard curve. So one is the lowest concentration and nine is the highest. Once we load our calibration curve, we are loading our um, sample. Um, and obviously it just depends uh, how many samples you would like to uh, run on a single experiment. That's how many biochips you use um, with a minimum of three up to four to five. So it's 50 microliters that you pipette in uh, on the surface of the biochip. Once it's ready, we are ready for our first incubation. Uh, then we insert our rack holder of biochips in the thermo shaker and um, wait for 30 minutes when it's shaking in the dark. Um, the thermo shaker is obviously provided as well. Uh, after the first incubation, we are adding our conjugate. Uh, conjugate uh, is really the only component that needs a little bit of preparation as it's supplied as the concentrate, but it's in a liquid form that you need to dilute in the conjugate diluent uh, that's also provided in a kit. And we recommend using the even darkened glassware or um, any type of, of the glassware that we can protect from light as it's sensitive. We are adding 150, sorry, 100 microliters of the conjugate to each well. And then we are ready for our second incubation, which is one hour incubation at the same conditions, so it's 25 degrees and 370 RPMs. Thermal shaker is very easy to use, it's just, um, you can just change the temperature and the shaking speed. After our incubation, second incubation, we are ready to wash. So first of all, we take up our liquid, uh, that was already in biochip, as you can see here in the video, and we do two quick washes with the wash buffer uh, that's provided in the kit. Just have to be careful here um, to load enough buffer, but not too much, so the liquid will not overlap to the um, surrounding biochips. After two quick washes, we perform four long washes, it means four two minutes uh, washes, so we wait for two minutes between changing the buffer. It's all just to improve the quality of the picture and uh, accuracy of our measurement. After washing, that takes approximately 10 minutes and doesn't matter how many biochips you are running, uh, we remove all the liquid and we are almost ready to start imaging our biochips using evidence investigator. Just before we start washing, we prepare peroxide and luminal uh, mixture um, to be able to uh, start our measurement. Then it's time to um, log in our uh, calibration curve and samples to the software. So we have a barcode provider and the barcodes we scan through logging our run to the evidence investigator. 
So each sample, you can write ID and what dilution you run the sample at, and the software will then uh, recalculate the results so you just get the final concentration in your sample. Once we load our mixture of peroxide and luminol to each well at 250 microliters, we start two minutes incubation in dark before we are able to insert the biochip to the machine. We are imaging each biochip by, one by one, starting with the calibration, which takes approximately two and a half, three minutes per biochip. After finished treating all biochips, we can check how our uh, calibrations work and the report. So what are the concentrations of our samples for all mycotoxins? So that was our video. Now I would like to move um, and tell you a little bit more about the validations uh, of our kit. So uh, we have available um, ergot alkaloids ELISA for detection of ergot alkaloids and also biochip arrays, MICO5, MICO7, MICO9. They differ depending how many toxins you would like to uh, detect. We have validated our um, biochip arrays uh, for multiple cereal uh, commodities, including barley, buckwheat, corn, oat, wheat, rye, rapeseed, soya, sugar beet, and also the final cereal-based feeds. Um, we have a protocol for validation of each of our kits, and the whole um, final data is summarized in the validation reports that are available on the request. Uh, which specify what are the assay ranges, standardization, specificity, precision, um, LODs, recovery, and any other supportive information um, specific for each kit. Um, just a little bit more about validation. So our micro 79 uh, are also validated not only to our internal protocols, but also to the Commission Regulation 519 from 2014 for mycotoxins. And as you can see, here's the picture. Uh, there's a table where um, there's a lot of numbers, but what's important is that each toxin was validated using multiple samples between 33 up to 81. And you can see what are the measuring ranges for each toxins and the LOD established our LOD was established based on the screening target concentration that was each toxin validated at what it means. And as you can see in the picture in the bottom of the slide, we tested all the samples blank before they were spiked and then after they were spiked. And uh, what I mean by the assay was validated is that there was no, no um, uh, interaction, there was nice split between negatives and positive, positive samples, which means that at that concentration, the assay is validated. So we have the values um, of LOD very low comparing, compar uh, comparable to the confirmatory methods, like for example, aflatoxin V1, uh, our LOD is very low at 0.25 ppb or ocratoxin at 0.4 ppb. We have quite extensive uh, range, uh, measuring range for, for toxin covering uh, the global legislations. There are also uh, two more columns in the table that might be important for you as you might be used to LODs calculated as the uh, mean of the blanks and also plus three uh, standard deviations um, and also cutoff values. So the cutoff value of the assay at which uh, we start assuming the samples are positive. Um, our micro seven kit was also validated according to the commission decision uh, 657 from 2002. And this whole validation was published in the AOSC journal. If you would like to have a read, let us know. We will forward it to you. We are also getting more and more citations and external reviews. And here is just an example of one that was written by the experts in Mycotoxin World showing how vigorous uh, validation we went through and that our method is suitable for the uh, purpose of the quantification of feeds um, in routine analysis. 
Uh, we are also the participants in the professional test schemes across FAPAS UK and Growing Testing Network and also by PIA recently. And here is just a summary of the tests that were done in 2019, the beginning of 2020. Uh, and as you can see, we participated in multiple of uh, schemes for maize, maize flour, cereal based animal feed, wheat flour and oat flour, and also wheat and barley. Majority of those samples were multi-contaminated with toxins. And as you can see here in the results, our micro-7 concentration, which is the blue spot, uh, was always within the measuring range, um, either for FAPAS or UK and Grain Nesting Network. Uh, now I'd like to move to the evaluated matrices. Um, uh, so we have nine validated, but we also have multiple evaluated matrices uh, for including corn gluten, cotton seed, DDGS, uh, palm caramel, uh, sunflower silage. What's the difference between evaluated and evaluated? Um, for evaluated matrices, we were not able to um, uh, to quantify the LOD level, and it's simply because uh, we were just unable to get enough negative samples to uh, establish it. But what we did is that we tested multiple more positive and negative samples and uh, checked them with the confirmatory results. So it was either samples to send us by customers um, or we sent for confirmatory data. So this is just the range of other matters um, that can be run on our batch of products. As an example, uh, one of our customers who is routinely using our kit for the corn gluten uh, is uh, participating in professional test scheme. And here are just the results showing how the third party evaluation um, is coming up with a satisfactory results using our technology for corn gluten. Um, Moving a little bit more about third party validations, um, uh, quite recently, 2019, our kit was validated uh, by the Institute in Hungary and it's a very nice publication. If you want to have a look, we also can send it to you. Uh, but we also uh, did some reproducibility studies over the last uh, two years. One was the AFCO study that I will tell you a little bit more in a minute. Uh, and uh, another one is the FAPAS uh, sample reproducibility study that we did across 11 sites, including the USA, uh, Spain, and Mexico. And as you can see in the summary, all the, sa the sample across all the essays um, read uh, very good results, all within measuring ranges. And we were able to achieve the coefficient of variation between 11 and 21%, which is really brilliant for the reproducibility study, with the whole out value between 0.4 and 0.9. Now I would like to move and tell you a little bit about AFCO studies. You might be very interested in that particular study we did in 2019. We have 17 samples uh, that were supplied by AFCO PD scheme and we tested them across nine governmental and also private laboratories. So the purpose of that study was to determine the method quality and performance at fit for purpose. And we set the criteria of accuracy so that all results will be, nine, that more than 95% of results will be within a Z-score, uh, but the reproducibility data that HORAD value will be for target between 0.3 and 2 range and acceptable between 0.3 and 3. And our general reproducibility will be below 40%. So what we did, we have our system that was traveling week by week to different lab. And after one day of installation and one day of training, the person from each laboratory was running the 17 samples on our Micro 7 biochip kit. And at the end, we summarized all the data from all the laboratories, and that's what we achieved. So the reproducibility uh, based on the HORAD value uh, was um, above 93% within our target range and all the samples, all the tests performed were within acceptable HORAD range. Uh, about accuracy, uh, we have a criteria to be above 95% and we are able to achieve above 97% accuracy for all the samples across all the uh, laboratories. So it's a very nice study with very um, favorable um, 
comments at the end. And here is just uh, a few questions that were asked that the um, um, analysts were asked from managers in the lab and they reply, for example, how was the customer service then? And the answer was the customer service with Randox was, has been fantastic. I have only needed the help a few times with our new evidence investigator and a simple uh, text to our service technician has solved each problem. Uh, in regards to our technology and just summarizing, uh, we using our technology, our evidence investigator, uh, you are also able to test for other um, commodities, well, for other um, um, our arrays on the, for, for detection and feed. So, um, of course, you can test for mycotoxins as we were just went through, including Myco7, Myco9, Myco5. But you can also apply the same technology to test for antimicrobials, for coxidostats, or growth promoters. And we also have a range of available ELISAs for feed. That's uh, all from me uh, for today. Um, thank you very much for joining. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, just give me a second. I just have to check if we've got any questions. Uh, we've got one um, asking about ergot alkaloids, if we can offer anything for testing. Uh, yes, we do have a specific ergot alkaloids ELISA. Uh, that is validated for uh, rye, wheat, and feed. Um, and interestingly, this ELISA was um, evaluated by third party with the other um, ELISAs available in the market with very uh, good results, showing that only our technology, our ELISA could distinguish between positive and negative samples. I have one more question. If if you can test and feed products. Uh, yes, we can. Yes, of course, like the method of Micro 7, Micro 9 was validated for feed. Um, so you can test on. Uh, we are getting now more and more questions. Uh, I'm sure we can answer them all uh, to you. Uh, directly, but if you have any further questions, please contact us and we will reply to you individually um, after the, uh, this webinar. So um, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Colin, for introduction. Um, goodbye.